10 years ago, I took a scholarship from the Lorillard Tobacco Company, and I used it to escape high school drudgery in suburban Los Angeles. In what would have been my second semester of senior year, I moved to Ghana and I became an English teacher. And I had one of those life-changing experiences that every Peace Corps type volunteer has, where I learned about the incredible hardship suffered by people in need and the incredible poverty in a place like Ghana. But what I really learned was that bright kids are the same everywhere. And wherever they can, they try to manipulate adults. <laughs> I came home to dozens of these heart heart-wrenching, handwritten letters from my former students, um, asking for pens and pencils, and even the occasional big-ticket item like a Game Boy. This one was tempered, at least, with a drawing of the Bible and a prayer from my family. <laughs> Others skipped the prayers and simply said, show me the money. <laughs> I was shocked. These kids were smart and industrious enough to write these long letters in pretty good English and march to the post office and send them to me, so why would they spend their time asking someone halfway around the world for pens and pencils? Well, asking for handouts, just like joining a militia group, is sadly the rational choice for a young person in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, which has around 150 million jobless youth. In rural India, roughly the same number of people can't find work, so they move to vast urban slums on the peripheries of major cities, leaving behind their loved ones in order to support them. Back in the 70s, the great design thinker E.F. Schumacher said that the greatest challenge we would face in the next century would be the global moron shortage. His words, <laughs> not mine. My students were part of a larger trend. We are witnessing a tremendous surge in human potential. In the next 30 years, more people will receive a formal education than in all of human history. 90% of the planet is thought to be literate. And youth in poor countries speak English, they use Facebook on their mobile phones, and they don't want our charity, they want a job. So the big question is, how do we employ them? Well, this is a photo of the biggest job creator there ever was, the factory assembly line. Henry Ford's innovation took the production of a highly complex machine and broke it down into small tasks that any person with a bit of training could do. The 20th century saw this logic applied to every kind of manufacturing. In Asia, millions of young women escape poverty by working in garment factories on sewing machines. But big factories can exist in most of the places where poor people live. Because to build them, you need good roads and shipping lines, you need waterways, and you need to achieve economies of scale with thousands of people working in the same place at once. Well, let me introduce you to what one of my friends called the sewing machine of the future, the cheap netbook. Thanks to Moore's law, the cost of computing, like, computing devices like these has gone down dramatically in recent years. The newest netbook out of China cost $65. 200 million laptops were sold just last year. And many are used in places that you'd least expect them, like rural Haiti. This is actually workers of ours translating text messages as part of the effort that you just heard about. And they're connected to new fiber optic cables and satellite dishes. This one is on the roof of that center and shares space with cooking stoves. And what all of this means is that the assembly lines of the future don't require 5,000 people to report to the same place. Because the assembly lines of the future look like this. They're digital. Digital work has mushroomed as people upload more and more information to the internet. Image tagging, identifying, say, strains of bacteria in the photographs that science fellow Susan Fortune captures in her lab, is something that computer vision algorithms have a very hard time doing. But tasks like these are easily done by humans and constitute a $40 billion industry. That's the size of Ghana's GDP. I founded Samasource two years ago to connect people living in poverty to this type of work over the internet. So we find outsourcing contracts from companies like LinkedIn and Google and break them down into small tasks which we farm out to people living in poverty. In two years, we've given work to more than 900 people with around $1.5 million in contracts in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Haiti. But what's most exciting about our model is that we can tap a new kind of worker, like Mamita Devi, who has a job for the first time in her life 
and whose father-in-law now babysits her children, or these villagers in rural Kenya who live two hours from the nearest city but next to a good school, or even youth in Dadaab refugee camp, the largest refugee site in the world, which has a small computer lab where refugees can earn five times what they'd earn doing anything else um, with this sort of digital work. And that's a photo I took last summer training some of these refugees on our model. The future of work entails lowering the barriers we've erected that prevent masses of people from engaging with the global economy as producers on their own, uh, on their own terms, as opposed to passive recipients of handouts or stuff produced by our companies. Work is not simply about income. It's about dignity. It's about the profound sense of self-worth that comes from being valued in a fair exchange. Handouts are not going to end global poverty. But work, real work, just might. Thank you.